Good morning and welcome to our Pacific Morning Show. We hope you're having an amazing Monday and getting to work and school safe wherever you may be. On today's show, it's very exciting. I am here with professional wrestlers Fale, Tony and Richard from the Fale Dojo. They are based in Oruhu and have an absolutely amazing story of taking New Zealand and Australian wrestling talent to the world. Fale, who was the owner of Fale Dojo, is one of the original founders of Bullet Club, a former IWGP Intercontinental and Tag Team Champion. <laughs> Tony is a head coach at Fale Dojo and has over 25 years experience in professional wrestling in America and Canada. And he has held multiple championships. And Richard is a Fale Dojo graduate who came through the New Japan Pro Wrestling New Zealand Dojo System. He has had his debut in November of 2022 on the NJPW Tamashi brand. How are you guys this morning? Why you guys look energetic? Right. <laughs> that was a long intro. <laughs> how are you guys? How was how are you guys this morning? How has your weekend been? It's been a whirlwind of a weekend, but we've been waiting for it, so it's been mm. good. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's very witty, but you gotta enjoy. It doesn't matter if it's sunny or rainy. Right. You know, I feel good inside, but the rain makes me look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Grateful to be alive, another day, mm, yes. another opportunity to smash your goals out. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm feeling good. Awesome. What are the awesome things happening right now at the gym and with business? We've, we've actually got so many things happening right, right. now. Um, gosh, it's where to begin. I think I think our, our, our main focus right now is our, our uh, debut of the Lion's Den, Saturday, July 29th. Mm. And that's at the uh, Odahu Intermediate School. And so that this is our first showcase outside of the dojo for our young lions to showcase their wrestling skills nice. in front of a live audience. Mm. And we've done exhibitions before at the dojo, but that's just more almost like practice mm. in a way. Uh, even though there's a live crowd now, they're going to be surrounded by people from you know, hundreds of people. Yeah. How are they feeling about it? They don't say much at the time, and that tells me that they're probably, their nerves are on. <laughs> so, yeah. It'll slowly hit them, but uh, yeah, I got faith that they're going to deliver the goods. Mm. Mm. I wanted to ask, how did you all get into wrestling? I'll start with you, Fale, if that's okay. Uh, how did I get into wrestling? I think like every kid, uh, we all watch wrestling on TV, mm. and... Uh, you know, we dream of being in that ring. But I started mine with um, my grandfather, who was a very big wrestling fan. And, uh, you know, I was born in Tonga. And the first six years of my life, I grew up with my grandpa. And we had a black and white TV. Mm. And a VCR. And it's, we played the same uh, video tape over and over and over. And uh, maybe once a year, my uncles or aunties will send another you know, WrestleMania tape, and we'll just watch it over and over and over. But that's what started, got my, uh, piqued my interest. Mm. So if, you, if you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where yeah. it started for me. Oh, nice. What about you, Richie? Um, yeah, pretty much the same, but um, I, yeah, I, was, I was with my father. Uh, he watched, uh, he watched a lot of wrestling and, uh, it was almost like we would watch it religiously, mm -hmm. almost like it was a, a, it was just something we just got used to, and um, I think for maybe we didn't notice at the time, but maybe for my dad, it was like uh, I would say it was probably like just a time out mm -hmm. from like you know everyday life, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> you're watching these larger than life characters, and it's like you know. And then you know you just it just everything is just like just comes out comes out to you and everything about it the storytelling yeah all the characters in it they all stand out and mm -hmm. you know being young seeing all that it's like you know well, what Fale San said you know oh, I want to do that and I'm older mm -hmm. sort of thing so yeah I would say I started all with my dad and then yeah just kind of grew from there <laughs> the first is when I was about. Uh, five years old and at the wrestling matches with my dad and my grandfather and intermission comes and we had the raffle ticket 
and we won and I got Play-Doh. And I remember we were at the Milwaukee Elks and I think my father went to get the Play-Doh. I said, can I get in the ring? Because all the teenage boys were in the ring with a wrestler named Tough Tony Bourne. Mm. No, no, he said, you can't get in the ring. You know, I knew all the kids were bigger, but I still wanted to get in the ring. I wanted to get in the ring. And I just remember saying, oh. And then I, once my dad left to get the Play-Doh, I just remember thinking, he can't catch me. <laughs> Pop can't catch me. And in my head I went, five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Because there was a ramp up to the ring. And boom, Tony! And I got into the ring. I was like, oh, you can't stop me now. <laughs> and so there I was in the ring with, with tough Tony Bourne. <laughs> it's always what I wanted to do. Mm. And um, I talked to people when I was 17, 18, 21, uh, and was turned away. And then when they first accepted me, the reality of it was I didn't follow through because I didn't believe in myself. And, uh, but that fire never died. And so by the time I was 25, you know, enough, I have to find out. And I got in contact with a, a local wrestler, Billy Jack Haynes, and he started training me and um, passed me on to another wrestler who was involved with the local mm. promotion and uh, Matt Bourne, and he got me started. And I was wrestling for four months, and he goes, I'm going to take you up to Canada. You'll be a lot more free up there, and there's going to be a lot of guys uh, your age and your size because the wrestling that I started was um, a lot of the older guys. So mm. I learned the old way, but uh, it was just grinding you into powder. So I'm going to take you up to Canada where you'll be able to really – spread your wings and fly. And I get up there and that's it. Mm. Guys, fly. <laughs> <laughs> what an origin story. Yeah. Yeah. So basically you were born to wrestle. It was either that or play drums and kiss. Uh. <laughs> Dream big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fooling Dream around. Big. Yeah. Well, what I heard, it sounded like he, wanted, he was born to fly. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Well, we've got to do something because uh, <laughs> being tall wasn't going to happen. So we've got to do something. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah. I've heard a lot of awesome stories about the Fala Dojo and how it started. You guys started from a garage. Yes, yes. Could uh, you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I started in New Japan and uh, training for a couple of years. They sent me to America, and that's where I met Tony. And I lived with Tony for... Uh, a whole year of training every day. And uh, we would travel all over the States and do seminars. You know, we'd do shows and then we'd do seminars, training with the local uh, promotions and stuff. And I kind of felt different. You know, wrestling is one thing, but being able to teach it mm. made me feel really different because it's, it's you know, it's, it's going through something very tough and coming out on the other side, you feel really good, but at the same time, you start to think about, you know, there's a lot of people who are going through their own journeys, but how great would it be for me to help them get through that? And I thought back to, of course, South Auckland's where I grew up and the, the opportunities that weren't there because I wanted to be a wrestler, but there was no way to become a wrestler here. So I thought, you know, that's what are the steps to owning my own school and running my own school? And I thought, if I go home, once I get home, you got to start somewhere. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of these entrepreneurs and a lot of these richest men in the world, and you would always hear about the stories about where they started mm. in the garage. <laughs> Most of them do. So that's where Fale Dojo started. I started with my brothers, my two brothers, um, my two closest brothers to me were the, at least twice my size mm. uh, at the time. So <clears throat> I thought, you know what, I'll start with these guys. So we started every day. I'll tell them, let's come to the garage, we'll do some training. And I'll just implement some of the trainings I learned in Japan. And throughout the whole year, they just turned into athletes and actually started teaching me how to, how to train. But uh, that's where I started. Started in the garage, 
two years later, I was uh, able to secure, secure, I was able to secure uh, funding to open up uh, at a bigger place. Mm. And we moved into Manukau, <clears throat> was there for two years, and then we secured more uh, funding and opened up in Oruhu at, at a bigger place. Mm. So that's where we are right now. Did you have to deal with any internal or external doubt during that time? Oh, for sure. Every step of the way, there's mm. always, always doubt. Not from just for me, but also, you know, people around me. And it's always it's a constant battle. Um, I remember one of the first um, uh, hurdles was was uh, moving from the garage to Manica to. A <coughs> Moving from the garage to Manukau, uh, one of one of my family members mm. said to me, "You shouldn't do it mm. you know, because it's going to cost all this money and all this blah blah blah." But you know, it always comes from people who are close. Mm. But uh, you know, now one that family member is a big supporter now, so you just got to prove it. You know? mm. And and it happens. Your friends are going to be doubtful. Uh, and then your co-workers, there's going to be a lot of hurdles on the way and it'll never stop. Mm. I, I just kind of wanted to add that those people that bring doubt, family members, that comes of a, from a place of love and trying to protect. Yes. But they don't see the vision that you see. Yeah. Once they start to see it because it's being realized... They're, they are the biggest supporters of the whole family. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Because we constantly get angry that they're hating on us or yes. not believing yes. in the vision. You know, I, I, it, yes. It's easy to just, oh, these people. But if you really stop and think it through, it mm. does. They're not, oh, we don't want to see them succeed. Of course they want them to succeed. Mm. But the, the protection. My family, same thing. Very protect. Oh, don't do that, honey. It's just so risky, so risky. And now, you know, I, I think a, a year or two ago, my aunt paid me one of the best compliments I've ever had in my entire life. And it just stopped me in my tracks. Mm. And she just said it matter of factly. And I don't know that I've heard a compliment from my family before. And I just, mm. whoa. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a, good, that's a good point to keep in mind, to be honest. And you started from the garage. What are some of the milestones you're accomplishing now? Wow. Which I know is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate goal is to run the same type of operation we do in Japan and also in the States. If you've, and if, whatever you see on TV, that's the ultimate goal for Australia, New Zealand, and the South Pacific. So that's the ultimate goal. But in getting there, you know, starting the school, getting funding, getting recognition from Japan and all over the world. Mm. Um, now we have students from everywhere. Mm. And there's more, I'd say 90% of our students come from outside of New Zealand. And that's a huge milestone to be able to get from one student to two, and now our biggest intake, uh, 21 kids. Yeah. Well, not, I say kids, but some of them in their 30s, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's a massive milestone, hitting that 21, and it's our 20th intake in uh, six years, seven years now. Mm -hmm. um, Tamashi, uh, getting the promotion running. So we're teaching them, and then we're feeding them into a, a stage for them to hone their craft mm. and then either stick around and learn more or take it back home and and uh, utilize it. Yeah. But uh, the next milestone now is really getting into the uh, community and utilizing the local talent because I'm getting, we're getting all the, the international um, recognition now, but we want to use our local, mm. how do you say, um, homegrown. Mm. Yeah, uh, homegrown talent. Yeah. And uh, we're starting that now and this week, actually, on the 29th. Nice. Mm. 
we're going to start working with the younger kids, uh, much like rugby, you know, pick them up at a very young age and then just teach them mm. because when they get to the right age, they can jump right in and and get go from there. Yeah. yeah. It's like a wrestling development school. Yes, development. That's so cool. You know, and like growing up, I didn't watch wrestling myself, but all my cousins and brothers watched it. Mm. Being a wrestler is like such a far-fetched dream because you're seeing it on TV and stuff. Yes. But like knowing that it can be accessible in like our hood oh, is pretty wow. awesome. And we have we have the man, the best talent there is in any sport. Mm. You watched him in the in the states playing football, or now I see a couple of Islanders playing um, baseball. Mm. and golf yeah they're well, moving up but <clears throat> the opportunities like for myself it wasn't there like look at rich mm. like i don't know if he'll be in the position now if the opportunity how many years ago three years ago four years ago yeah. wasn't mm. there like he would have had to go to japan and then figure out how to make it on, on yeah exactly on and on his own or but, with, mm -hmm. yeah. but for him to go through here and become a pro wrestler, it, it went from there to here. Mm. Like you were saying, it was so far-fetched now. Yeah. It's at your doorstep. Now for the guys, for people like Rich who who say, I can make it, I, I want to do that. It's at your doorstep now. Mm. So you got to turn your words into action, mm. which he has. Mm. Um, you know. How was that training experience for you? The dojo pathway. How true? No, seriously. I watched the documentary. I wanted to cry watching it because I was like, man, I could never ever put myself through that. But how was it for you personally? Um, it was really intense, but um, there's a, there was always a purpose, always a purpose mm. for it. You know, um, I think when you first get in there, yep, you're nervous, and you know, you kind of, you know. Doubts creep in, mm. uh, you know, whether you can keep up or, you know, you'll always be last because um, Valesan and Tony said, no, I've, I've had a lot of this and a lot of times where I've doubted myself and oh, I can't do that and I just question a lot of what I do. But um, Tony San and Valesan have shown me the way and they've, uh, they've always had the belief in me, even when I never believed in myself. But uh, in terms of training, yeah, it's really intense, but um, you have to expect it if you're looking to represent New Japan. Because, mm. you know, this is not, you know, it's not something, you know, it's not local. This is international. And I think with some people, they just think, oh, because they like wrestling. Yeah, I can just jump in and do the training and they should be able to let me in. Mm -hmm. But New Japan is, is a world renowned. Mm. and professional wrestling mm. and um you know and you have to prove to you know father son tony son that uh you know you're worth investing in yeah. and you're worth their time yeah. and that's why they expect such uh you know um, they have high expectations because they just want to send out the very best to new japan and they're not only representing, you know, not representing just the dojo, but, you know, you're also putting your name out there, your reputation, you know, mm -hmm. all your work. So I think, um, yeah, well, yeah, in terms of training, they're just trying to root out. Yeah. They're trying to root out the ones that are just there for show. Do, and, do you and, guys find a lot of people there for show or do a lot of people drop out? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think that um, a, a lot of people have a have an idea of of what wrestling is and a lot of it's from a local level where it's more of a hobby and one of the things that i say is this is a lifestyle this is a very unique thing at the dojo because uh you know if if, if you are uh, if you make it to train with the all blacks you've played rugby as a kid all through school through the university mm -hmm. getting used to training harder and harder and, and more complex trainings. So by the time you start training with the All Blacks, well, you know, you can do the plyometrics and run the sprints and whatever that mm -hmm. training requires. This is like coming off the couch, basically you can do because, you know, there's sure there's some people that take a mixed martial arts and, and, and 
have wrestled and played sports. But there's also people that just go down to their local wrestling and uh, where it's a hobby and they just kind of fool around and learn a few moves in the ring. But there's no conditioning mm. uh, that they have. So then they come here and they're completely overwhelmed. So, you, I mean, it's like coming off the couch and we're all of a sudden training yes. with the All Blacks. Yeah. So we, you know, and I've talked to Fale about it. I was like, that's the interesting dynamic of what we're doing. And we, you know, he saw it too. We have to change how we go about things so that the guys don't run away screaming. Mm. So it kind of turns us into a, a wee bit of life coaches mm. in a sense as well. Um, and, and, uh, you know, because this training ultimately is you versus you. And once you realize that, and once you're able to understand and conquer yourself, you can do anything you want in this world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely anything. If you're willing to put in the work mm. and, uh, yeah. Mm. One thing I'd say is, uh, you notice our size. <laughs> <laughs> I, if you notice Tony's size, <clears throat> uh, the training is not <clears throat> is not catered for for specifically for one person. Mm. It's it's generic and it covers everybody. So it doesn't matter how big you are, how tall you are, how short you are. Mm. You're all doing the same training, mm. and especially for guys our size it's very tough because we have an extra weight that we have to carry and you know but that just it's just a testament to how tough you know people our size are yeah. to get through the same training mm. that the normal size people have you know breeze through mm. and uh, you know Tony's uh, shorter but at the same time, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're bigger, he's shorter. There's a lot of people who are at the right size, but we all do the same thing. Mm. And to pass it is, is a whole different story because not many people, not yeah. many people do. Mm. So, you know, we're pretty fit for big yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's crazy. And there's, there's entire gym jargon, you know, like body, like you should be this body doing this. And then just seeing, um, the documentary where it's like a bunch of different people yes. with different body sizes just mm -hmm. doing the same thing. I'm like, that is crazy. <laughs> and I give it up to you guys. But I wanted to ask, for anyone who's wanting to join um, the development squad at the dojo, what would be one advice from each of you? We'll start with you, Richard. Um, advice, uh, I, would, I would go on to um, you know, Facebook and the, all, all the information still. Um, if you can, log on to... Uh, New Japan World and watch Lions Raw if you guys want to get a taste of uh, you know and experience what it's like when what you're gonna be in for, but um, it's something that you can't get ready for. Mm. It's always something different. Um, but um, yeah, we're we're all over social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, mm. so all the infos there, and we have uh, FaliDJ.com as well. It's got uh, all the information. You need to get into our intakes in there and other information like that as well. Hmm. Yeah. Safale, anyone wanting to join? One piece of advice for them? <clears throat> <laughs> Come with an open mind. Yeah. That's my advice. Mm. Uh, because a lot of guys come in with expectations, but quickly find out that it's not what they thought. Mm. So if you're open-minded, you'll accept what comes. That's it. Yeah, that's an excellent point. The other, the, one of the things, and actually Fale brought it to my attention a couple of years ago, and he always talked about it, and I think it's so important, is uh, leave your ego at the door. Um, that ego plays a part, and I think disrupts and gets in the way of so many guys. I want to show them I can do the whole thing quicker or finish first, not about finishing first. Mm. You know, when these bigger guys are doing a thousand squats, they may not do it as fast as somebody else, but the instructors, we're not, I'm not done, sir. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, you don't get any extra points because you did it 
quicker than the others. Um, so it's learning to keep your ego in check and that that's a major part of it. So an open mind, keep your ego at the door, all that stuff. Uh, I don't know that a lot of guys have, have had that brought to their attention before. Mm. And it really, mm. over the three months, it changes so many people. Mm. Just being aware of that, being aware of the you versus you, you know, all of that. Um, so, I mean, no matter if they go on or they, they decide that this isn't for them, most everybody leaves changed, a changed person at the end of it. Mm. So. Yeah. It's a lot of value. And I just wanted to ask one more question. Yes. And it's what's one thing or life-changing quote that you guys have kept close to your heart that has helped you get through every challenge and to where you are today? I'll start with you, Tony. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, Coming from me, someone at my size that has gotten into this business of giants and survived mm -hmm. and thrived, you can do anything you want in this world if you're willing to put in the work. And that's it. Not when, that. when, you, when you find your passion, it, 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 uh, putting in long days of work, it's not work. So... Yeah, if you're willing to do the work, anything's possible. Whatever it is that you want to do in life, or if you have a goal, if you believe in it, mm. you're halfway there. Quote that I always uh, keep close is uh, doubt kills more dreams than failure mm -hmm. ever will. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, if you're getting into professional wrestling and that, you know, and I've, and I've learned it off Fale San and Tony San. Um, you know, you just got to be willing to put in the work mm. Mm -hmm. and you got to be willing to roll off the punches when things get hard mm -hmm. and when things get difficult. Like, you know, you're on the brink of giving up and you think you're not good enough. And that's probably, that's probably where you're going to get your breakthrough. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That's awesome. Me. That was awesome. I hope you guys are all inspired from this wealth of wisdom that has been shared this morning <laughs> and it'll get you through your day um thank you so much guys for coming into the show thank you thank um you. i hope and wish you all the best for your journey and i am so encouraged by where you guys have started to where you guys are now and uh, we'll be checking up the graphics for the event this saturday make sure to buy a ticket drop through if you like wrestling even if you don't like wrestling buy a ticket um we'll be there our blue wave team and also these right. awesome wrestlers here and um, have a great morning. Good morning. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah.